This lecture will focus on the approach to undifferentiated chest pain in the emergency room. When you think about chest pain, you want to first build the critical differential of the six chest pain killers. That includes ACS, PE, aortic dissection, tamponade, tension pneumothorax, and the unicorn esophageal rupture. You'll notice that in most patients, the approach boils down to, is it one of these three? ACS, PE, or aortic dissection. That's because the remaining three in the critical differential can kind of be ruled out based on history, physical exam, and a little bit of deductive reasoning. For example, tamponade and tension pneumothorax are both clinical syndromes that include hypotension. So tamponade is somebody who has a pericardial effusion and it's hypotensive. Tension pneumothorax is somebody who has a pneumothorax and it's hypotensive. If you're not hypotensive and you have a pericardial effusion, you just have a run-of-the-mill pericardial effusion, the same with pneumothorax. Um, for esophageal rupture, usually these patients present with uh, you know, lots of vomiting, retching, or had some kind of recent instrumentation like an EGD that led to an iatrogenic perforation, and they can be pretty sick based on the mediastinitis. And so with history and deductive reasoning, we end up kind of ruling these out because you're not going to miss somebody who is hypotensive. You're not going to miss somebody who is super sick. The next step in this process is thinking about the remaining three. So for aortic dissection, I want to know three things. What does the pain feel like? Is this aortic type pain, meaning ripping, tearing, pain that radiates to the back? I want to know what the chest x-ray looks like, specifically the mediastinum. And I want to make sure that it's not wide. Uh, wide in mediastinum is any um, mediastinum that's greater than 8 centimeters. And I want to know what the pulses feel like. Uh, is there any asymmetry in, in the pulses? For PE, we use the PERC criteria, or the pulmonary embolism roulette criteria, for people that are 50 years of, uh, younger than 50 years of age. Um, and with this, you can use the history and the vital signs alone to try to rule out uh, PE. Or for people that are older than 50, we use the Wells criteria to risk stratify plus or minus a D-dimer uh, to help our decision making. And lastly, you'll notice that we usually end up defaulting to, could this be ACS? Before we go deeper into ACS, this is where you want to take the time to think about, can I build a story where I can convince myself that something other than ACS is going on. For example, does this patient have any sort of musculoskeletal component? Is there a good, you know, reproducible chest pain story? You're basically trying to make sure you do a thorough physical exam and history to see if you can find some alternative explanation. If you can't, you really have to go down the pathway um, and further risk stratify for uh, acute coronary syndrome. ACS gets divided into two main categories. ST elevation ACS and non-ST elevation ACS. ST elevation ACS, the only thing you need to diagnose that is a positive EKG, meaning ST elevations on the EKG. Non-ST elevation ACS gets divided into two other categories, one of which is NSTEMIs, and the other one which is unstable angina. To diagnose an NSTEMI, you need to have a negative EKG. What I mean by negative me is anything other than an ST elevation. So it could be normal, it could be T-wave inversions, it could be ST depression. Each one of these is more concerning than the previous one. And you want to have a positive troponin in an NSTEMI. Usually any troponin uh, that's positive is considered an NSTEMI. Uh, you can further 
figure out if this is a type 1 versus type 2, uh, but for us, any positive troponin is an unstemmy. And then for unstable angina, the way you diagnose that is with a negative EKG and a negative troponin. And this is where it gets really interesting, because really what we're trying to figure out is, do we know what's going on at the coronaries? Okay, and we only have three, outside of a cath, we only have uh, non-invasive ways of looking at what's going on in the coronaries. And there's only three things we can look at to determine that, and the three surrogates are EKG, troponin, and history. And for most of ACS, you'll notice that we're able to use one of these three to kind of help guide us in figuring out, is ACS going on? Is there an acute coronary syndrome? But for unstable angina, we don't have two out of the three. And really all we can use in this case is history. Right, so for unstable angina, you have a negative EKG and a negative trope, but a positive history. <clears throat> the problem is not all patients come in with that classic unstable angina syndrome, where you have this exertional substernal chest pain that's relieved with rest um, or relieved with nitro, um, or have this history of stable angina that has now become unstable, meaning that it's escalating in frequency or severity. It's now more constant when it was previously intermittent and very predictable. Um, again, not all of the patients that we have come in with that story. What you'll notice a lot of the time is that patients that don't come in with that classic unstable angina story and have a negative EKG and a negative troponin, uh, but came in with chest pain, and you can pin that chest pain story in on some other cause, uh, what you'll see is that we feel uncomfortable because the patient is has any combination of being older, has a lot of risk factors, or has a decent story, right? So you can have any one combination of this. So you, you see an old person with a bad story but a lot of risk factors. Uh, you'll see a younger patient with a lot of risk factors and a good story. Right? So any sort of combination of that. And when I was training, we didn't have a good way of predicting, does the patient in front of us, um, is that patient having an acute coronary event? We had some ways of determining patient's cardiovascular risks, meaning what is their likelihood of, um, af of having coronary artery disease with the TIMI and the GRAY score. We didn't have a good tool to determine, does this patient have um, an acute coronary event until we developed the heart score. That was until somebody developed the heart score. So the heart score is a validated tool, prospectively validated, that gives you a risk profile for a patient uh, coming in with chest pain that you may be concerned for uh, ACS. And what it really does is it breaks down these patients uh, under that non-ST elevation ACS category that gets further subdivided into that unstable angina category, and it tells you what is this patient's risk for unstable angina, and it puts them into one of three buckets, the low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And the important thing to know here is that out of all of these three, the low risk category is the one that gets discharged because their risk profile is less than 2% risk of what's called of having a what's called a major adverse cardiac event. So uh, this patient has a very low risk of you know either dying of any heart related issue within six weeks if you follow the heart score um, and they're considered to be low risk by heart score. These patients can be safely discharged with a appointment uh, for a stress test within 72 hours. Patients that are intermediate risk need to see a cardiology within a cardiologist within 24 hours. Um, and since that's difficult to do, 
we usually put these patients in a cardiology observation unit where they get ruled out and then seen by a cardiologist for either med management or uh, for provocative testing. And the patients that are high risk are basically equal to the patients that have unstable angina. Somebody who's considered to be high risk by heart score is basically telling you they have unstable angina. And those patients get admitted to cardiology for delayed calf. And the last thing to talk about is what do we mean by rule out ACS? When we say we've ruled out ACS, really what we've ruled out is STEMI and NSTEMI. We really haven't, as we discussed before, figured out if the patient has unstable angina, right? The only way we can really determine that is if the patient has a very classic history for unstable angina. Um, and the only other surrogate we can use to figure that out is the heart score to predict the patient's uh, probability or the likelihood of this specific chest pain episode being unstable angina, and that gets divided into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. We do know that with uh, more time, as more time passes and we have and start collecting more and more negative or quote unquote negative or non dynamic EKGs and negative troponins, we know that the likelihood that this being an acute coronary event goes down, right? And so um, when do we get one EKG versus two EKGs and troponins to try to rule out uh, ACS? Uh, well, that's all determined about, all determined by how long your chest pain's been going on. So if your chest pain has been going on for greater than three hours, um, you can probably get away with one set of EKGs and troponins uh, that are negative to rule out ACS. And if your chest pain has been going on for less than three hours, you're going to have to get two EKGs and troponins um, that are negative or non-dynamic to definitively rule out ACS um, in your patient. But yeah, I mean, that was long-winded, but that's how I approach undifferentiated chest pain.